But let's continue. Verse 12, Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Now here's where it gets good, because here again, I read the stuff of these wing nuts here, and they say that James actually wrote the book of James as a, a condemnation of Paul, and it was actually going to be used in his trial. They, I mean, it, this stuff is actually out there, you know, believe it or not. So here we're going to see James standing up, and he's going to rebuke Paul, and he's going to say, you are a false apostle. How dare you speak to Gentiles? We're supposed to keep the Torah to be saved. You watch. That's what James is going to say. You know he's going to, since he wrote to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad in James chapter 1, verse 1. Here we go. Now we're going to get to it. James is going to correct it. You ready? Here we go. Verse 14. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. And after, after this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Let's see where am I reading to here? Excuse me for a minute. Okay. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Huh? But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then please it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas surnamed Barsabbas and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren, which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. That can't be right. It's to whom uh, Paul gave such command. No, it's uh, actually a letter from all of the apostles, including Peter and James. All of the apostles at Jerusalem, all of the elders at Jerusalem, and they're all saying, this is from us. Send it to the Gentiles. You don't have to you know, do these things here. We're going to see about this. Let's continue. Verse 25, It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. The Apostle Paul was the Antichrist according to the first Christians. There's a video we watched at the beginning. Well, that liar right there. Men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Paul didn't preach Jesus. And the other apostles hated him. You see the lies that these muslucks come up with? Verse 27, We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by my mouth, or by mouth, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Now here... Here he's going to say about keeping the Torah to be saved. You watch. Verse 29, That ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves ye shall do well. Fare ye well? I didn't see anything in there about keeping the Torah to stay saved. Brethren, there are so many false prophets right now, it's insane. And all you got to do to debunk most of this stuff, just read your Bible. Like I said, that whole sermon last week was almost, I mean, going through the Bible is never unnecessary. Don't get me wrong. But all of it could have been solved by just going to Ephesians chapter 3. Paul says the gospel that was revealed was a mystery in the past. The gospel, re excuse me, revealed to me, Jesus Christ, his death, burial, resurrection. It was a mystery. People didn't understand it. 
It was there. It was veiled in the Old Testament, but it was a mystery until I showed up and the Lord revealed it to me. It wasn't Paul that he sat down and said, let's see, how could I work this thing out to create this conspiracy of Christianity down through the century? It was revealed to Paul. And all you got to do is just read the Pauline epistles. Just read through there. Ephesians chapter 3. Somebody's going, they were saved by looking forward to the cross. Did you, Ephesians chapter 3 is a mystery in the past. They couldn't have been saved by looking forward to the cross. That contradict Scripture. Oh, the, 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 Jesus was, you, you have to, you know, the early Christians, they rejected Paul and they all believed in Jesus and Paul was the only one that was subverting people. No, actually, I read in Acts chapter 15, not written by Paul here. I read in Acts chapter 15 that all the apostles and elders are saying, this is the way it is. And we're going to send out our beloved brother, Paul. You don't call somebody that you say is a false apostle or the Antichrist, you don't call him a beloved brother. Read your Bible, people. I'm going to get back to this in just a little bit here, but verse 30. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered and the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. Okay? Don't fall for these liars. And I'm going to show you just in case you say, well, that was just a fluke there. They, you know, they were just doing that kind of a political thing. Let's go to 2 Peter. You know, not one of the Pauline epistles, you know, unless I guess you're that, that foolish uh, muslik there, you know, 82% of the Bible is written by Paul. Yeah. <laughs> okay, dude, whatever. Second Peter chapter three, verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our Beloved brother, Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Doesn't sound like Peter was rejecting Paul there again. Our beloved brother, Paul, as it was revealed to him. You say, well, he didn't know Jesus personally. He wasn't one of the 12 disciples. Oh, no, but he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. We're going to see about that in a little bit. Verse 16 as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, president of biblical criticism, you know, unto their own destruction. We're going to see that slob there. We're going to see him at the great white throne judgment someday, unless he repents. Verse 17, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, if you're a Christian, you know these things, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, like the guy there, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Don't fall away. Don't let these wicked, lying devils come to you and get, destroy your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the King James Bible, the epistles of Paul. Okay? Don't let them do it. Now, of course, they do the other thing here. You can turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 1. They say, you know, Paul would have been, there. Are, there is no 13th apostle. There's no 13th apostle. There were 12 apostles and Paul has made himself an apostle. And there, there's no proof that he was a real apostle. New proof, new proof. We're going to see about that. But uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 23 through 26 says here, And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, Show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell, fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Wait a second. There were twelve apostles. So Matthias would have been the thirteenth apostle. 
No, because Judas got kicked out. He, by transgression, he fell. He went to his own place. Judas was a devil. Okay? He's out of the picture. Now the number's down to 11. Now they chose number 12, Matthias. But this is the last time you ever hear of Matthias. And I talked about this in other studies. There's debate. You can go back and forth. You know, were there other apostles? And some people say, well, you know, the apostle, the name apostle doesn't necessarily have to mean the actual 12 chosen men. It can be like disciples and apostles kind of are interchangeable, you know, wording there and stuff. And I do understand some of the debate back and forth. But the fact is, in the book of Revelation, you see that there are 12 apostles. The number 12 is used. It's a very specific one. So even if you can say that there are other Christians that are named apostles or called apostles, there are only 12 chosen apostles, 12 special apostles of the Lamb. So Matthias was not the 12th. I don't believe that for one second. I believe Paul is the 12th apostle. And we're going to see why here as we continue. So somebody comes along and they say, Paul would have been the 13th. Take him right there to the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 26, and show him that Matthias was numbered with the 11. And the verse right before it there, verse 25, says Judas by transgression fell. So there's a spot taken out there. And uh, another one that they'll do, another little attack that these funny bunnies will do, is they'll say that, um, you know, that uh, Paul, you know, that, that uh, you're supposed to come in the name of Jesus and preach the name of Jesus, but Paul came in his own name. Turn over to the book of Romans. I'll show you how. They, they play all these little games, all these little fiery darts of Satan. You know, you know Paul came in his own name. You know, and you'll see that. And you'll say, Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Or they'll say, I saw this one video and the guy's like, it says, Paul, a servant. And then they stopped. They don't want you to keep reading and see where he's always giving Jesus Christ credit. So I looked it up. I did the research. And I looked at the Pauline epistles, which most people would agree with, from the book of Romans, the whole way through the book of Hebrews. A lot of people believe the book of Hebrews is written by Paul. I personally do too. Okay. And of course, Hebrews, I believe dispensationally is for the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. But there's, of course, some doctrine in there that's good for us today, too. But the point is, let's look at the books that Paul actually wrote. Romans to Hebrews. Now, he comes in his own name, right? And he doesn't give Jesus Christ glory? Well, that's funny because you see the word Paul appears, Romans to Hebrews, the word Paul appears only 30 times. The word Jesus appears 231 times. Hmm. Seems like... Paul is glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ a bit more than his own name. You know, 30 verses 231. So again, just do the research, people. You know, I mean, these Muslims come out and, oh, you know, he came in his own name. He didn't glorify Jesus Christ. Huh? You know? I mean, you know, if, if some saved, born-again Christians come out that actually profess to believe in Jesus Christ, profess to be Christians, maybe you can listen to them. But these Muslims, Muslims, and I'm a Christian atheist professor at a, a theological seminary. And Hebrew roots, cultists, and stuff like this, all these people that saying that they are Jews when they're not. They're the synagogue of Satan. And these are the people that you listen to. These are the people that you let destroy your faith. Well, it's all over the internet. Well, then it must be true, you know. <laughs> sure. Okay, another thing here that you can use on these people is that there is no description. This, yes, there's no discrepancy. Excuse me, between Paul's two accounts of conversions, conversion in Acts nine and Galatians chapter one. So go to Acts chapter nine. This is one of the big ones. They'll say the two accounts don't match. You know, so there's a contradiction. <laughs> it's so funny. These, you know, I got this whole book back here. Uh, Right here by Dr. Peter Ruckman. You can say what you want about him, but you know he's still one of the best scholars on the King James Bible issue. Right there, the errors in the King James Bible. Right there, it's uh, over 500 pages. It gives you all the different scriptures back here. Index all the different uh, you know supposed contradictions in the King James. I've never seen a real contradiction in the King James Bible, not once. 
unless you're talking about dispensationalism, then yeah, there are things that are going on in other dispensations that don't go on right now for a Christian. You know, if you want to make that a contradiction, well, it's only because you're not rightly dividing the word of truth. But you know, they what they'll try to do is they say, "Yea, hath God said?" You see, they'll bring out a contradiction, and once they show it to you and they spin it a certain way and make it look like it's a contradiction, then you go, "Oh boy." There's a contradiction. And they say, how can you really trust the rest of the Bible if this is a lie right here? Well, that's true. How can I trust the rest of the Bible? See, then they got you. Then these stupid muslicks come along and they're like, oh, now we got these dumb Christians to try and think that the Bible contradicts. Now we can ruin them. And that's where these people come up with this stuff. But let's read here. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. They say, well, Paul never met Jesus. He did right there. And this ridiculous professor, guys, uh, it, was, it was actually the story, of another uh, Greek story that Paul borrowed it from. Paul isn't borrowing a story here. He's telling firsthand account. Give me a break. I mean, the only people that would come up with that would be people that had an agenda, a reason to get rid of the scriptures. Kind of like if you're saying that Jesus is dead and that, and that, uh, you know, I don't believe in salvation. I'm a Christian atheist. Uh, okay, let's continue. Verse 6. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. Now this next verse is going to be important. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. And of course, Ananias does, and, and he goes over there, and, you know, Paul receives his sight. But did you notice, before we go to the account in Galatians chapter 1, did Paul go to Damascus, or was he led to Damascus. Did Paul go to Damascus looking for Christians that he could get to talk to and stuff like that? Did Paul say, I'm going to head over to Damascus and there's going to be a, maybe I meet, might meet a guy there called Ananias. Because I know Ananias is a saved man, so I'm going to go look for him. I'm going to look him up. He lives there in Damascus. Is that what happened? No. He was led to Damascus by the men that were with him. They led him there. They dropped him off wherever he was headed. Maybe a you know, the equivalent of like a motel or something like that or somebody's house or whatever and he's there for three days and three nights and he's just, what do I do now? You know, and the Lord shows him in a vision. There's a man coming named Ananias. He's going to fix you up. That's going to be important. Turn to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 verse 15 through 24. Okay, it says here, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days, but other, other of the apostles saw I none save James the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you behold before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by the face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith 
which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. Well, I'm afraid that there's a contradiction. You see, because in Acts chapter 9, he goes up to Damascus. But here, and he meets with Ananias. But here it says, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. There you go. I'm sorry, we have a contradiction. In Acts chapter 9, he goes up to Damascus to meet Ananias. Here, he says, I didn't confer with flesh and blood. Oh boy, that's a contradiction, isn't it? No, if you just read the text. Verse 16, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Does that happen? Did that happen when he was on the road to Damascus there, when he got knocked off the horse? Was he saved? No. Did Paul say, gets up off the ground and he says, man, I got to get to Damascus. I got preaching to do. No. Paul gets up and he's going. They said, what's going on, Paul? Huh? Who said that? Can't you see, Paul? And Paul goes, I can't see. I'm blind. What am I going to do? Well, we'll take you to Damascus and we'll drop you off there. I don't know what you're going to do from there. Paul didn't go up to confer with flesh and blood. The guys that were with him took him to Damascus and dropped him off. And were like, what is, I don't know what we're going to do with this guy. Here you go. Just put him in the house there. Uh, see us all. Goodbye. We're going to leave. You're on your own. He didn't go up to Damascus to confer with flesh and blood. What he's writing about here is his conversion is in the first part of chapter six or verse 16 there. To reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. And he's saying after that, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. So Paul is saying at that point in time, I got converted, I got saved. And from there, I wasn't saying, okay, now I got to go up to the seminary, you know, and get my training. That wasn't it. When God revealed things to him, when God said, okay, you're saved, first he gives him a vision that Ananias is going to come and the scales are going to drop off of his eyes. Now he's saying, okay, and he visits with the brethren and things like that. And after that, he says, all right, I'm going to go out and have missionary work. He conferred not with flesh and blood at that point. He didn't say, okay, let's, who can I join? What, what uh, local fellowship can I join? What ministry can I join or something like that? No. After his conversion, after he's there with Ananias and some of the brethren, he starts going out into the synagogues and he starts to preach. Immediately after his conversion. Okay? So what's going on here in Galatians chapter 1? He's giving a more broad view of what happened. Back in Acts chapter uh, 9, he's simply saying, I got knocked off the horse, I was blind, the guys led me to Jerusalem, and from there, you know, Ananias finally comes in and he tells more detail in Acts chapter 9. There's no contradiction. None at all. Okay? And so, again, what's going on? You have Muslims coming along and saying, let me explain to you the Scriptures. Even though the Bible says that they are dead in trespasses and sins, they are spiritually dead. They can't understand the Scriptures. The Holy Spirit isn't about to reveal anything to those people. All right, continuing on here. Okay, now another thing that you'll get is they say, how can you verify that Paul was inspired by God? Because after all, he's a false apostle. You know, How can you verify anything that Paul said? Very simple, by two things. He would have to manifest the signs of an apostle and he'd also have to give accurate prophecies of the future. Let's see about that. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11 and 12. Okay. I am become a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So Paul is saying, you people that... You know they're they're attacking him. It's interesting that the Corinthians are going, well, who are you? And uh, and, and Paul says, okay, um, you know I, 
you know, what's he say there? Uh, and nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. In other words, he's saying, I, I can manifest all the signs that Peter and James and John and all these other guys, Matthew and things, I can do all that they can do. There's nothing that I'm behind those guys in, though I'm nothing. See? Though I be nothing. You know, he was still humble with it. He's just saying, you've, you've compelled me to speak foolishly here. You know? And I wrote the signs of the apostles. You say, what are the signs of the apostles? Well, go over to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Again, our little uh, professor there of New Testament uh, textual criticism. That guy, I'm sure, rejects these verses, so he would just reject this and say, "Ah, oh, I don't, you know, those are it's not even accurate to the most oldest and best manuscripts and all that Alexandrian foolishness." But Mark chapter 16, okay, it says here, uh, verse 17 and 18, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils; they shall speak with new tongues; they shall take up serpents; and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Okay? It doesn't mean the last one there. They lay hands on the sick, and if the sick give enough money, they eventually recover after three weeks. That doesn't mean that. We're talking about instantaneous healing. Boom. Like that. Now, did Paul manifest these signs? Well, what was the first one? Verse 17. In my name shall they cast out devils. Did Paul ever cast out a devil? Well, Acts chapter 16, verse 18, the, the woman has a spirit of divination, and Paul turns around and says, okay, I'm tired of this, and he casts the devil out. And the devil leaves, and Paul goes to jail for it, because <laughs> they see that the, the hope of their gains is lost. Okay, so Acts chapter 16, verse 18, the first sign of the apostles, Paul got that one. Okay, what's the next one? Uh, they shall speak... It. Uh, with new tongues. Okay? Does Paul Paul speak with other tongues? Well, in uh, Acts chapter 21, verse 37, he speaks Greek. Uh, and then in in uh, and then Hebrew in Acts chapter 21 verses 40 through uh, 20 chapter 22 verse 2. Okay, and then he also admits in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 18, that he speaks tongues more than ye all. So yes, he did speak in other tongues. Definitely. What about taking up serpents? Verse 18 there, it says, They shall take up uh, serpents. Okay, what about that? Well, if you look up uh, in Acts chapter 28, verses 3 through 5, Paul is putting sticks on a fire, and a deadly viper comes out, fastens on his hand, and it's biting him, and he just kind of goes, and flicks it into the fire. And they're watching him and stuff, and they're thinking, he's going to drop over dead at any minute, and he doesn't. Okay? So not only did he take up a deadly serpent, he was bitten by poison, and it didn't hurt him. Poison in him. What's the next one? They drink. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Now, is there any record of Paul drinking a deadly thing and it not hurting him? Well, I wasn't able to find anything there in terms of him drinking some kind of a deadly thing, and it didn't hurt him. Uh, maybe somebody can fill me in if you know a verse I couldn't think of any uh, that where Paul would have been drinking some kind of poison or something and it didn't hurt him but before you get excited if you're a Muslim or a atheist or Hebrew roots and you're saying see see he wasn't a real apostle well I'd like you to show me any verse where any apostle drank a deadly thing and it didn't hurt him I don't know of any okay so you can't be hard on Paul and accept the other apostles but uh and, you know, like I said, if you want to make the thing of him having poison from a deadly viper, a deadly snake in him, and it didn't hurt him, well, that would qualify him in that point again. What about um, the last part there, verse 18? They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Did Paul ever lay hands on the sick and have the people instantly be healed? Well, in Acts chapter 20, verses 9 through 12, Paul is preaching to the believers and a young man falls out of the window, bam, they take him up dead, they say, oh man, and Paul comes down, raises him up from the dead. And then in Acts chapter 28, verses 8 through 9, the father of Publius 
is laying si sick of a fever and a bloody flux, I think it is. And Paul touches him and heals him instantly. And then it says that many others also came and Paul healed them all. So did Paul have the ability to miraculously heal people? Yes. So then what do we have? Paul manifested all of the signs of the apostles in his ministry. And a lot of that stuff there is written about in the book of Acts, which Paul didn't write. So again, oh, Paul was a false apostle. That's a lie. Paul was a real apostle. And he manifested all the sign gifts of the apostles. But what's the other uh, proof there? The other proof is that Paul, for him to be real, for him to be a real prophet, a real apostle, he would have to give accurate prophecies of the future. 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4. And these, a lot of these you're going to be familiar with if you know anything about this ministry, but never hurts to go over the scriptures again. First Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Why wouldn't the Muslims like that? Because they command to abstain from pork. The Bible says there commanding to abstain from meats is a doctrine of devils. A little kick on Islam there, isn't it? Oh, well, we'll have to just have to reject that part of the Bible and we'll say it's the false apostle Paul that wrote that thing there. Uh-huh. And uh, how about uh, having their conscience seared with a hot iron? Like a lot of these Muslims? Mm-hmm. And you say, well, see, it was just Paul, though, that had to change the dietary laws. No, we read about it in Acts chapter 15. And actually, the very first one that received the revelation about God saying, Arise, Peter, kill and eat was not Paul. Hmm. Next we're going to go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20 and 21. Another prophecy. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. Avoiding Profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. I'm a textual critic. I know the Bible. I can say and I can see this and I can study all these other Greek pagan myths and stuff like this and see how Paul stole some of that stuff and blah, 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 blah. Nonsense. The only reason I'm doing this study is because brother and sister asked me to do it and because a lot of you you're going to you're going to get into some of this stuff with people and you're going to hear this and, and you know be like me and you'll be like huh what do you mean paul's a false apostle what are you talking about well now you have a sermon that can answer them. okay but otherwise i just avoid these weirdos second timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, like saying Paul's a false prophet. Yeah. Incontinent, fierce, like the Muslims, despisers of those that are good, like the Muslims, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such, turn away. Paul spoke absolutely 100% perfect prophecy for these end times right there. And last, we're going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come, future, you know, future prophecy, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts 
shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Now let me just say a couple things here in closing. All right. There are more and more and more of these false prophets, false movements, and everything else coming out all the time. More and more of this stuff. And they come out and they just are, they're attacking the very basics of our faith as Christians. Stuff that you just accept and you just go, well, of course I know this. You know, they come out and they say, you're not really saved because, you know, I saw the one thing, what was this one stupid Muslim guy? He was like, uh, um, Show me one verse of Scripture. You get a $5,000 reward to any verse, anybody that can prove from Scripture that Jesus said, I am God. The exact words, I am God, worship me. And people go, oh, it's not in the Bible. Well, then Jesus must not have been God and he must not have wanted to be worshipped. <laughs> See, and these people, they do these, they play these little word games, little games. You know, the word repent doesn't appear in the book of John. Oh, then you just ditch repentance, you know. Jesus doesn't say, I am God, worship me, in these exact words. Even though Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, then they took up stones to stone him because of blasphemy, you know, because he's making himself God. And they, people come and they fall down and they worship him. It's there. It's there. It's in the Bible. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Yes, Jesus did declare that he was God manifest in the flesh. Yes, he absolutely did, in spite of what the ridiculous Muslims try to say. But you see, they play these little word games, they play little, little things, you know, and stuff. Well, you can't exactly prove, you can't do this, and you can't, you know. We, we, don't, we don't, the Bible doesn't say these exact same words, so therefore, you know, your whole faith is just shot. There are three very simple things that you need to remember, okay? And you need to just keep these things in mind. People come along and try to rattle your faith. Just fall back to these simple three things and just remember this. If you want to know, is, is my faith in the Word of God and my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, is it legitimate? Remember three things. First of all, you have millions of testimonies of saved, born-again Christians. Christians that were willing to die for their faith. Christians that are willing to love their enemies. Richard Vermbrand. See if I can get a picture of him. Good picture of him. That's kind of a small one there. You know? There he is. Just released from prison and smiling. Show me a Muslim like that. Show me a Catholic like that. Tortured for Christ for 13 years. Tortured for Christ and he comes out and he says, I love the communists. I hate communism, but I love the communist people. And I, he had a burden. He didn't even want to leave Romania. Other brethren from other countries paid for his release and he's like, I don't want to leave. And they're like, you have to leave. You have to get the word out about what's going on here to the Christians, to the underground church. They finally talked him into leaving. He didn't want to leave. He wanted to stay there and witness for Jesus Christ. They let him out of jail and he goes back right back to the underground church thing and he's arrested in no time at all. Islam? Atheism? Are you kidding me? They can't love their enemies. Christians can. Christians can be tortured for their faith and never give it up. Real Christians. Okay? Millions of saved Christian testimonies down through the years. Millions of people that have tried everything else in life, everything else that the world has to offer, and they don't find contentment or happiness until they put their faith in Jesus Christ. Number two, how about hymns? Thousands and thousands of hymns written to praise Jesus Christ. Where are the thousands of hymns written to praise the Pope, to praise Muhammad, or Allah, or Buddha, or Krishna, or any other devil, false pagan god. Where are the hymns? 
You say, that doesn't prove anything. Oh, sure it does. Sure it does. You see, people write hymns to praise someone that brings them joy. You see? You worship God with song. Where's the hymn books at for the Muslims? Do you ever have a really bad day? A really horrible time in life? And you pick up a hymn book and you start singing a hymn? You start singing, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. And instantly you start feeling better. What are you going to do as a Muslim? What do you have as a Muslim? You got nothing. How about another one? Answered prayer. We're going to pray to, to Allah for what? What's Allah done for you? What's uh, science, you know, atheism, reason, you know? What's that done for you? Nothing. My God came down here in the form of a man, died on the cross, shed his blood to pay for my sins. What's your God done? Well, he showed us the way. The way to what? Well, if you're a Muslim, your great prophet Muhammad showed you the way to fornicate with as many women as you can and, and be basically an epileptic, uh, insane nut and die and go home to hell. Well, I guess that is the way of the Muslims. That's not what Jesus Christ did. You see? And you see people come and they start throwing all these attacks and things at you and they, they throw at these things like the Galatians 1 and the, and the Acts chapter 9 thing and at first it's like, that is kind of weird. How does that line up there? And you, you, know, you start to kind of have that little bit of a dart, fiery dart of the wicked kind of sticks in you. And instead of letting that thing in there and start to fester and start to spread that infection throughout the whole body and eventually gets to the mind and destroys it, you take that thing and you go, wait a second. If Christianity is wrong, why did all those Christians suffer? Why did the millions of Christians be martyred? Why, you know, why did all the lives change? Why did my life change? If Christianity is wrong, then why do we sing hymns? Why do we sing praises to, to the Lord? It, it makes us feel joy in spite of suffering, in spite of hardships. If Christianity is wrong, what about all those times God answered my prayers? And you pull that dart out and you go, I don't think so, Satan. You drop it and the devil goes, well, then I'll get you with this contradiction. And you go, I don't think so. I got a sword of the Spirit here. I'm going to keep this thing sharp. And I got my shield of faith. Back off. But you see, Christians that uh, put their Bible down and that start to read some of this stuff here, the Nesselaland text, and they start to question the Bible and they start to say, it's just a translation, maybe not really a good translation. Well, it's you know, it, it has some nice points, but it's shield of faith drops, and the devil goes, "Oh boy, I'm going to put some darts into you, some fiery darts." Don't let these people shake your faith, brethren. The Bible has never been answered, as far as. Uh, these people coming out saying contradictions and contradictions. There has never been one proved. Not the King James Bible. Never. Never has, never will be. We have the only Bible that actually accurately predicts the future. We have the only one. There's never going to be a time when somebody's going to prove this book wrong. And we have the testimony of history on our side. You know, Christians died. Christians were martyred. Why? Because Paul started a fake religion? You don't die for fake religion. You don't, uh, the women back there in the dark ages where the priests would come and they'd take their baby and they'd say, deny Jesus Christ or we throw your baby to the pigs and we're going to let you watch the pigs eat your baby alive. And those mothers probably were crying and they said, I'll not deny Jesus Christ. You don't do that for fake religion. Okay? You don't do that. And it's so funny because you have these fake religions like uh, atheism and those guys, they get out on the battlefield or they get into some kind of really bad situation and they're screaming and crying out to God. 
God, help me, God, help me. Uh. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because their religion's fake. And when things get bad, they drop their fake little thing of, I don't believe there is a God. They drop it like that. They know there's a God, and they cry out to Him for help. Oh, yeah. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just really am praying for those saints out there, Lord, that they would stay in the armor of, of Ephesians chapter 6, Lord, that they would not let their guard down. They would not start to fall for this nonsense, these attacks, Lord, from lost people, Lord. They're just such ridiculous attacks. I just pray, Lord, that those people out there that are saved would, would just stay in Your Word and continue in them and, and, and hold strong and, and, and stand strong, Lord, that they wouldn't back down. And uh, just not even listen to a lot of this nonsense, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, for those out there that are deceived and that have not come to a true saving faith, I pray that they would look past all the hypocritical babble-building system and, and all the hypocritical professing Christians that are in our world and the church history that includes Catholicism as supposing Christianity, that they'd look past all that, Lord, that they would look past the Alexandrian philosophy of textual criticism, higher textual criticism that destroys any Bible out there, that the lost would look past that and, and truly seek you, Lord, and that you would lead them into the truth and, and to salvation. And uh, Lord, I just pray for everyone out there that they would be busy about working for you and, and just uh, stay active until you take us out of here. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. That's going to be it for this study. And very interesting one. I Like I said, I, I really didn't hear about a lot of this stuff. It just kind of got past me. And, and uh, just incredible the heresies that people are falling for nowadays. Because, you know, they just stop believing the Bible. They start putting the Bible down and, you know, stop reading it, stop believing it, and everything falls apart. And it will for you too if you do that. So, that will be it. I uh, have some book reviews coming up here in the future and, uh, of course, some more studies. Uh, I do have a study coming up here. I'm not sure when I'm going to get to it, but I do have one where there was a rabbi that uh, wrote a bunch of reasons why the Jewish people reject Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And he quoted a lot of uh, things in the Old Testament. So I'm going to actually be uh, going over that stuff point by point. And uh, like I said, I'm not sure when I'm going to get that done because I have... Uh, I have a whole pile of, of sermon requests, and it's like I got to get that, but I also want to do this thing here. And so, and I got, you know, I'm going to be doing a review of this one here, The Tortured for Christ, the book by Richard Vermbrand. And I'm going to be doing a review of these two books here The Hiles Effect by David Cloud down there. And I'm also going to be doing a book review of The House Church Movement, also by David Cloud. So I'm going to be doing some book reviews here coming up. Uh, I did finally get my study done on the Lord of the Rings issue. So that will be out probably about the same time as this sermon. So please keep us in your prayers. Uh, thank you all to all who donate. Keep the ministry going. And um, I guess that's it for now. So uh, thank you very much for watching. And of course, uh, you know, too, another thing. I, I did get some other questions on the house church, frequently asked questions, and some things I neglected to mention in the first part, the second part, and the third part. So there will be a fourth part coming out. And, uh, you know, if you can think of any other questions that you possibly have, let me know before I make part four, you know, because I don't want to make a part five. So, <laughs> all right, I guess that's going to be it. So we will see you in next week's study. Thank you for watching.